president-elect of City Club. I'm joining you from my little home office on a snowy, icy Friday. I hope all of you are warm, comfortable, and safe where you are. Virtual programming has unique advantages for attendance on a snow day. I'm glad you're with us today to talk about how we can transform education in these COVID times and beyond. Before we, again, we begin, we acknowledge that the land we are on is native land and was stolen from people who lived here for thousands of years before us. In the Portland region, this land is the territory of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and Molala, the Wasco, Cowlitz, and many other indigenous people, all of whom have long known the power and beauty of the Columbia and Willamette rivers, raised families here, and built communities and traditions that carry on. Together, we recognize their unbreakable connections to this land and honor the resilience of their ancestors and the hope of future generations. Thank you. On to the program. Do you remember what it was like to be six or 12 or 17? Each year of your life then felt like an eternity, didn't it? You changed so much. Friends in school were everything to you. And even when one or both weren't going so well, you were focused on your school time and school culture in ways that our kids are missing right now. To a significant degree, you became who you are in those years. School and families have faced a nearly impossible challenge this year. Kids need to keep learning and growing, but they also need to stay safe. And their parents and grandparents who take care of them need to stay safe. Now we're beginning to see some hope for recovery. As vaccines go into the arms of educators and people begin to feel safe again, there's a chance that our children will be going back to school in the near future. Whether the return is yet this school year or not until the next, we have to wonder, how do we make up to them for the lost time? It's clear we can't go back to school in the same way we always have. So in what ways will schools need to change to rise to the challenge of so many children who need more from their school experience? Today, as part of the City Club's State of the Possible series, we've planned some tough questions about the future of education for our three guests. Portland Public Schools Superintendent Guadalupe Guerrero, Gresham Barlow School Superintendent, Dr. Catrice Pereira, and Oregon's Early Learning Director, Miriam Calderon. Before I turn the screen over to Toya Fick, Executive Director of Oregon Stand for Children and today's moderator, I want to thank Bobby Reagan for producing today's program. Thank yous also go out to our season sponsors, Chevron, The Standard, and Wells Fargo for making our State of the Possible series possible. I'd also like to thank our supporting sponsors, Kaiser Permanente and Tonkin Torp, and our partners at Pamplin Media, X-Ray FM, and Merge Design. If you're ever unable to watch our forums, you can listen in via X-Ray Station, including 91.9 FM, and 107.1 FM where they're broadcast live. Or you can catch them later on demand on our YouTube channel and PDX and at pdxcityclub.org. Now it is my pleasure to pass the mic, figuratively speaking, obviously, to Toya Fick, Executive Director of Stanford Children, Oregon, who will host today's conversation. Thank you, Toya. Thank you, Leslie, and hello everyone, and welcome to our discussion on the state of education. I am delighted to share the virtual stage with three thoughtful and amazing educators and leaders here in Oregon. But before we jump into our conversation, I want to set one expectation for today's discussion. Sadly, we will not be able to definitively answer questions like, when will my kids get back into the classroom? Or how soon will all the teachers be vaccinated? Or anything very definitive with a very specific date. Uh, trust me, as a single mom with two school-aged kids, both in elementary schools and in Portland Public, I really want to know the answers to those questions. And I look forward to the day that my kids can go back to learning in the classroom as opposed to our dining room. Uh, but sadly, there are way too many known unknowns to be very definitive today. So instead, we're going to focus on 
the lessons we've learned over the past years and how those lessons will impact how we educate our kids moving forward. And we might answer questions like, how will we handle snow days in the future? Um, with that, I wanna reintroduce our panelists. Today, we have Early Learning Director Miriam Calderon, Superintendent for Gresham Barlow, Dr. Catrice Pereira, and Portland Public Schools Superintendent, Dr. Guadalupe Guerrero. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Let's jump in. So many of us, I know I have, have read many things about the work that you all have done over the past years to continue serving kids and families. I wanna give you all a few minutes to tell us what life has been like for you all over the past year. How has your day-to-day -day changed? What have been a few bright spots that you've seen along the way? What are you most proud of? So to give us a, a more clear picture of what things have been like for you all over the last year. We're gonna start with Director Calderon and then move to Dr. Pereira and then Superintendent Guerrero. Thank you so much, uh, Toya. Thanks to you and City Club for including me in this event. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation um, with so many other incredible education leaders serving student and students and families during this incredibly challenging time. Um, I think I'll start with the first part of the question. What has life been like? Um, challenging as it's been for so many of us. Um, on a personal note, I'm a mother of two children who just started high school uh, this fall. Dr. Guerrero is um, our superintendent. Uh, they wanted to make sure to ask um, if there will ever be snow days again. Um, so you can let me know that later, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> superintendent Guerrero. Um, but honestly, like so many other working families, I'm juggling responsibilities of work with virtual learning for my own children. Let's just say that learning doesn't play to my children's strengths as learners. And, and one of my children is having an especially difficult time. Uh, an idea that's resonated with me throughout this year is we're all in the same, same storm, but different boats. Um, in my personal and professional life, it feels like I'm juggling the realities, uh, you know, vulnerability, humility, gratitude, and hope. Uh, at the start of this pandemic, our agency had a laser-like focus on implementation of, the, of a historic investment in early learning. Uh, with the passage of the Student Success Act in 2019, um, our state was making a new $200 million a year investment in expanded early learning opportunities for children, families, and communities that have been historically underserved. Uh, suddenly, the focus for our agency and our partners has, sh has shifted to pandemic response. So I guess I'm pretty proud of the pivot. Um, it's clear that this emergency has no predictable end date. Um, and now that that's more clear, we have made an eventual adjustment back to balancing pandemic response mm -hmm. with the critically important work that we do with our partners that's key to Oregon's future. And that's eliminating race, income, and zip code as predictors of whether children, families, and communities have access to early learning. So what it's looked like is standing up an emergency childcare system, working hard alongside providers to make it safe for childcare and early learning to operate during this emergency. We've diverse, we dispersed PPE to childcare workers, distributed nearly 80 million in federal funds to keep childcare programs afloat. Um, at the start of the pandemic, we really feared that a prolonged childcare program closure would lead to a permanent closure. And we by no means had this childcare supply pre-pandemic in our state. Fortunately, most of our childcare programs are managing to stay afloat. We're approaching kind of near pandemic levels. Um, we've been able to move forward with the SSA implementation in early learning, expanding access to nearly 10,000 families statewide. You know, our partners, have had to shift a lot, um, manage public funding uncertainty, timelines, expectations changing, find new ways to provide services to children and families. I think the bright spot for me in conclusion is that I feel that childcare and early learning has been recognized as essential. I think prior to the pandemic, um, we didn't really do enough to respect this workforce, value it, um, invest. And so the bright spot is now that we know and recognize it as essential, I hope, you know, we never turn back from that and we continue to make the necessary investments to make this system more equitable and fair. Wonderful. Dr. Pereira, your perspective on how the year has gone and what things have been like for you this year. Yes, thank, thank you, Talia, for that. Um, definitely the, a great question. And I also want to say thank you to City Club for having us here um, today. It's exciting. And anytime I can spend 
a moment advocating on behalf of my students and my district is well time is time well spent. Um, and I can't really put it more in a better fashion than Miriam has. And so I will pick up with saying that, um, you know, obviously you have given us an opportunity to do some reflection uh, about moving forward um, on the horizon and looking at things through not just a um, microscope, but also a telescope, right? Because we need to know what's going on right now and kind of know how we're going to get there and plan for it. And before all of that, I must acknowledge the opportunities to serve this community uh, when we close back in March. My board, my team, my staff, we continue to lead with guiding principles, principles that we've embraced, um, guiding principles that anchored each of us in common values uh, and also helped generate collective action for us and want to ensure the safety and wellness of our students. We're ensure, trying to ensure that they have food. Some of our families do not have that and also access, um, but also giving them a sense of care and connection, right? We also look to have, to ensure that we were able to cultivate and connect with relationships. Uh, you know, the student connections were very important to us and ensuring that that was happening on a regular basis. So much so that one of the things we'll take forward with us is advisory. So when we were able to make build relationship, we had a set amount of time every day for our students and our teachers to uh, get together and kind of do some wellness checks. Also, um, the third one I would say would be the centering equity and efficacy on our behalf. Um, when you prioritize equity, you prioritize every single one because that allows you to give um, what students individually need, right? Uh, and then lastly with that is to be able to innovate. Um, as we've navigated through these complex changes, um, having that spirit of possibility uh, is always a, a plus. Um, and so with those principles in mind, I can say that we continue, I'm proud of the fact that we continue to distribute food to students. We are uh, distributing about five to 6,000 meals per day. Um, we, we look to ensure that our students have access to one-to-one -to -one technology. Uh, we have about 12,000 students in our district and um, we've handed out a good six, 7,000 uh, laptops um, for our students to have access. And we also are looking, uh, I'm also proud about the fact that our teachers were able to adapt um, and our administrators as well. And I'm proud that our students and families for sure uh, continue to show up and, and, and they're engaged. And lastly, I'm also uh, proud of our student advisory work group who have advised me throughout this, how to best tackle these issues from their perspective and deemed it most important, right? And finally, I'm very proud of the strong advocacy and awareness that our team has raised across the county and on behalf of East Multnomah County. Wonderful, I love that saying when you prioritize equity, you are giving every kid what they need. So thank you for that commitment. Uh, Superintendent Guerrero. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for thank you to City Club for gathering us together on this important dialogue. Um, I think I heard two parts of your question, Toya. You know, how has the day to day changed and what are some of the bright spots? Uh, well, for sure, I think we'd all agree uh, our typical day to day routines as we knew them a year ago, they've been altered. Uh, though I still put a tie on and come into the office most work days. Uh, but in all seriousness, this past year has presented really unique and challenging circumstances for in particularly school district leaders uh, everywhere. Uh, this is my fourth year uh, in the superintendent role in, in Portland Public Schools. Uh, and as leader of a complex system, you know, being flexible, innovative, creative, patient, uh, the, these are qualities that are, are critical, uh, especially in moments of, of uncertainty or when you're trying to navigate uh, challenging circumstances, uh, not something we're unaccustomed to. Uh, but I never could have imagined a year uh, fraught with so many unprecedented challenges, uh, in particular, the obvious uh, global pandemic. Uh, and not to mention the very real dynamics in our reason, region. I, I think it's important to sort of recognize the particular economic impact on our families, uh, the racial uprising in particular uh, here in Portland that, that has impacted our youth especially. Uh, but COVID-19 was new. Uh, and I think everyone initially uh, was just trying to make meaning of this emerging crisis. And you saw the messaging sort of 
changing in very fluid and dynamic ways from the federal government on down. Uh, there wasn't, we, we didn't yet have clarity initially, if you think back, what seems like a really long time ago. Um, and we haven't as an institution, as many layers of institutions, uh, really had to deal with a pandemic and I think over a hundred years. So given this dynamic situation that's been occurring in, in real time, uh, it's continued to be a situation where we, we really want to be prudent and, and responsible in our decision-making process, uh, that we're not making those decisions based on headlines or politics, uh, especially this past year. Uh, but just like we ask of our students, you know, let's apply some careful critical thinking. Uh, let's make sure and collaborate and inform ourselves uh, with those experts, you know, who are going to be important uh, in keeping us informed. So, and as you know, this pandemic's really magnified a lot of the racial inequities that, that have long existed in, in our systems, public education, public health, human services, uh, and those have really sort of come to the forefront uh, during this time. Uh, and there have been these really important moments, uh, I think, uh, in our social fabric. The, the tragic and public murder of George Floyd last summer, you know, inspired this national uprising in our country. Um, but through it all, and I, and I think my colleagues have, have, have mentioned this, our students and our families, especially our Black, Native American, and communities of color, you know, they've shown resilience. So to answer sort of the bright spots, uh, part of the question, this continued resilience that our students and our families have, de have demonstrated, especially those that have been impacted by these pervasive injustices, uh, is, is, is not, is not a, it's an important one to, to make sure that we spotlight. I also have to say, uh, as far as bright spots, our educators, our leaders, our school principals, uh, how adaptive uh, and how incredible their dedication has been um, I have to give a shout out to our nutrition workers, our frontline workers. They have never failed to show up, not for a single day. That commitment to our students uh, really deserves commendation. And you've seen business and philanthropy step up. Our fund for PPS has raised a million dollars in relief. Those are grocery, internet, homeless supports to families in need for those essential services. Uh, we're appreciative of that level of generosity. Our racial equity, social justice partners, it's always been critically important to, to do this work in partnership, but particularly now, as we think about how we support and connect with our students and our families, particularly in underserved communities, the fact that they have been at the table with us and we have been creative uh, about trying to find solutions and making sure that we're reaching our students. My hat's off to just to name a few, not to be uh, exhaust, uh, exclusive here, but uh, SEI, Latino Network, ERCO, I mean, I just appreciate how they too have been very adaptive in, in their work with us. So collaboration and partnership is another bright spot, you know, and it's not just our, our community-based organizations, our culturally specific partners, uh, but the partnership that has been essential uh, with my own colleagues, um, with, with my own colleagues here in the region locally, with colleagues around the country who are all wrestling with the same circumstances, maybe a little different community context, but still asking themselves, how do we maintain this continuity of learning and how do we support our students through this crisis? So I do also think it's a bright spot that communication and coordination has really out of necessity now more than ever uh, improved, you know, with our local, our county leaders uh, and other partners. So I'm really proud of that. Uh, through it all, I think uh, we've tried to remain steadfast in our commitment. Um, we're still on track. We want to reimagine Portland Public Schools. That's what the community charged us with in their mandate with a new vision. So it's time to, we really lean into our theory of action that really focuses on our Black and Native students. Uh, and so we hold true to that North Star as much as possible, despite these challenges. And in fact, create sometimes other opportunities. Uh, so in the middle of all of this, I feel like it's a real privilege. It's an opportunity to apply leadership at this time. But for how everyone has stepped up to put our students first, I'm really most proud of that. That's amazing. Uh, and you said it really well, the continued resilience of our children and families and teachers and educators and everyone in the system has truly been awe inspiring. So thank you for those remarks and thank you all for painting that picture for us. Uh, just a brief note to our audience. 
As we continue our conversation, we will find ways to share some of your questions. So if you haven't gotten a question in yet, it is not too late. Uh, go to Twitter or to the City Club's Facebook page and use the hashtag share, uh, state of the possible to submit your question. Uh, and now we're going to take a few moments to uh, see some ads from our sponsors for this event. It's only human to pursue the elusive while also capturing the possibilities, even something like CO2. Over the last decade, Chevron has spent over $1 billion on carbon capture projects and is investing in startup companies working to transform carbon into new forms of energy. Thank you, sponsors. Now back to our program. Uh, Director Calderon, this next question is coming to you. Uh, you said a few minutes ago that since the start of the pandemic, child care was considered an essential service. And I think you're absolutely right about that. I read many reports uh, about daycare centers remaining open, uh, particularly for healthcare workers and other essential workers to have a place for their young children to go. Now, I know it wasn't all smooth sailing from day one, so I have a few questions, and I'm hoping that we can apply some of those lessons learned to uh, the K-12 space as well. So a couple questions here. Can you tell us what it took to keep child care centers open and then talk about whether or not those services were equitably, equitably distributed to families across the region? Sure, thanks for that question, Toya. Um, it most certainly hasn't been smooth sailing. Um, the governor um, issued her stay home, save lives order in late March, um, which closed many non-essential businesses in Oregon and shut down a lot of our sort of daily life. Um, um, and we, in that order, child care programs were um, were closed, but um, child care providers programs were given the choice to open as emergency child care. Um, and I come back to that moment because I think that was a very important choice point related to equity. Um, we heard from child care providers um, things like, please don't close us, uh, please close us. K 12 is closed and we are scared. Mm -hmm. And we heard from, we are scared about getting COVID. Um, uh, you know, again, I think this goes without saying, this is um, a, a line of work to do well. You don't maintain six feet physical distance. You know, you you have um, proximity um, when you're caring for children. Um, many of our pro providers in our state are home-based programs. So this is opening up their homes to multiple households, right? Um, and their own family members. Um, uh, also as well, being in that home and um, increasing the likelihood and the potential for um, contracting COVID. Um, at the same time, we heard as many providers saying to us, please keep us open. This is our livelihood. Um, we have no vacation. We don't have sick leave. We're small business owners. Like if we don't work, we're not getting paid, right? Um, uh, we also heard we're essential. We need to keep doing this for our families. What will our families do of essential workers when we don't work, others don't work? Um, so the governor's order was structured to give programs and workers choice, you know, self-determination as best as we could to say open um, or close. When many providers and um, made the decision those to open, um, originally we saw um, you know, a, 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 a steep drop in the number of facilities we had slowly, as I mentioned before, th during this past year, we've seen more facilities open. Um, you know, we um, they've had to open under very specific, um, 
you know, requirements, public health requirements that that work to make it as safe as possible for the workers, for the providers, mm -hmm. and for children and families to be able to utilize um, child care during this time, especially our essential workers. Um, the the one of the challenges is is that these meeting these requirements um, are challenging and more costly, um, and um, child care at the same time, their child care is a system that is almost entirely funded in our state by, by, by parent revenue and what parents can afford to pay. So um, there's been a lot of unpredictability about whether parents will use it or not, whether they'll feel safe. Um, you know, so some have struggled with lower enrollment. It affects their bottom lines. It's been a lot of extra work to implement these requirements. Um, I would say what we've seen is programs that had little or no public funds or don't serve parents that can still afford to pay for a service they're not using. Those are the ones that have really struggled. Um, to stay open um, to implement these important health and safety requirements. Um, I think this fact alone, that parents are the biggest payer into childcare and that there's so mm -hmm. few public dollars going into the system, which is really the opposite of how we finance public education beginning in kindergarten, right? Um, is the reason pre-pandemic is one of the biggest factors of why we have don't have an equitable and affordable and robust childcare supply in our state. And what it has meant pre-pandemic Continue, continuing through this pandemic is that the same communities, same challenges have persisted, right? Rural communities of color, economically segregated communities, um, the market-based system doesn't work in those communities and those programs have struggled. Um, we lacked infant care. Um, significantly before the pandemic. We, last I checked, we have out of 18, 18 counties in our state have fewer than 10 infant slots. Right, so um, we haven't had a pandemic proof early learning and childcare system. Um, we have done with inequity, trying to get more resources to make it more affordable for low income families. We've tried to um, get more dollars to providers apply an equity lens. I say one of the things I'm taking from this experience is it's not just, you know, part of what we need to change and build is the infrastructure that surrounds childcare time and time again, whether it's getting childcare workers mm -hmm. vaccinated, whether it's getting them the necessary resources to be able to implement these public health requirements. We've had to build the roads while we've been trying to do it because the infrastructure to support quality, safe care and early learning hasn't been there right from the beginning. Absolutely. Um, let's turn for a second to K-12 because you, you mentioned we have an opposite sort of system here. In fact, we had the opposite response as a state when it came to K-12. I know we, we had a lot to learn about the virus and the impact on families and kids and, and different age groups and, and different races and all that. So I just want to uh, ask Dr. Pera, Pereira this question. Um, let's pretend it's February 12th, 2020. And we know everything now that we know everything that we know now at that point, right? Can we rewind the clock and think of schools, K-12 schools as an essential service? And if so, what would it have taken to make sure that that system is open for our kids, particularly, you know, as we think about access for women <laughs> uh, for childcare in the, in the workplace, we've read a lot of reports about the fallout of the coronavirus and the impact of working women in, in our state and, and across their country. Um, I think schools are an essential service and part of the reason many women are leaving the, the workforce is because they're not open, right? So let's, let's think about, you know, a year ago, if we know everything now, a year ago, what would it have taken to keep schools open? Yes, thank you for that question, uh, Toya, for sure. Um, as a, uh, a female leader uh, in a female-dominated profession, um, as a BIPOC individual, um, I, I have struggled with that as well about the fact that how it is impacting our, our profession. When we are already in a scenario, have been for the last decade, I can say, uh, Guadalupe uh, can, can obviously reiterate that as well, and the fact that we have uh, we're challenged to get educators, um, quality educators in our classrooms with our students and our teachers. But here's what I can tell you about the fact that we didn't, uh, you know, what happened with us last year, knowing now and helping you understand what would it have taken to keep our, um, our schools closed. Here's what I can tell you. We did not have that option, right? Um, 
we were also on the stay home, save lives order from our governor. And since then, I think we have learned a lot about the virus and how it spreads. But I also am very thankful that our governor did take those actions at that time so that we could learn more about the virus and reposition ourselves in order to do things and serve our communities. Um, and although we're not um, able to continue in person, we're still not in person, uh, we were able to continue some essential services. And to me, that's most important than learning any content area is to ensure that we have, um, I like to say Maslow's before Bloom's, and that's Maslow's hierarchy of basic needs versus Bloom's taxonomy, which is a method, philosophical way of uh, teaching and learning. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's it Maslow's before Bloom's, people before programs. Um, and so again, being able to deliver meals, providing learning materials and devices, uh, connecting with our students for their well being. And I'd say the heaviest lift was putting together an action. Uh, plan um, of one-to-one -one digital learning platform in less than two weeks. We had a plan for three years. We did it in less than two weeks. Um, so I, I, it's hard for me to now, for going forward to swallow. Oh well, you know we we can't. We don't have time to do these things. Yes, we do. It's about what we prioritize. And Team GBSD, I think, rose to the occasion and continued to serve our community while simultaneously dealing with their own family challenges during this pandemic. And today, even in the snow, we're still delivering instruction. For GBSD, no more snow days. This is what it is because we can uh, deliver instruction uh, uh, digitally. Um, and so that, that makes a big, big difference in what we do and what happens. Now, truly, um, what has been essential for me and in, in Gresham Barlow is need, it is needed no matter our instructional model it's access to Wi-Fi, which is a global community we find ourselves in, right? And I would dare say that it should be a need uh, over anything else. It should be one of those Maslow's hierarchy needs uh, or basic needs for uh, citizens, no matter where they live, no matter their address. And truly, if I can be frank, school districts should not have been in the business of trying to uh, organize digital connectivity for students. Um, but we had to partner and we stepped up. But the biggest question we have to ask ourselves with that, knowing that uh, the access was limited, I think not necessarily just as educators or uh, being Organians, it's about what is the price of digital exclusion in the long term? You know, if we do nothing about this, if this is why educators stepped up, we do nothing about this, we continue to allow and, and afford and, and enable uh, the learning gaps to continue, right? We have to have access and students have to have access, right? Meaning, I know I need to know who has access and what they're able to do with that access because just having access doesn't also, is, is not equitable either. Um, and so I think for those of us listening today, we may not even be able to connect with what I just said about access and access. However, myself included, um, I don't think I can, I don't know that I could survive without my smartphone, right? Um, and we, we can go on and on, right? I can go online right now and airline tickets. I can do diagnosis, look for more information, etc. But schools are facing a new challenge now, um, and that's most learning will evolve on the on the web. And it's important for us to ensure that we're doing what is necessary. Because just having a device doesn't mean learning is equitable. All students need to have the same access to Wi-Fi, thus the ability to use the device as well. Well said. Maslow's before blooms. I've never heard that one before. I like it a lot. And then Wi-Fi as a as an essential need. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Superintendent Guerrero, can you describe the challenges that lie ahead with regard to reopening schools and how uh, schools are using, you know, funds from the state, from the feds, to sort of leverage um, those funds to reopen our schools? Great question. Um, how do we marshal all available funds and resources towards meeting our core mission, I think is the question you're asking, Toya. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we have to be super conscious and mindful of the fact that uh, we know this pandemic is already having a disproportionate impact, but we, we can't allow it to amplify pre-existing opportunity gaps. So you heard Dr. Pereira say, we know that there's a digital divide 
And we would prefer not to have to worry about telecommunications and digital deserts in some of our neighborhoods. But guess what? We spent millions on making sure that our students had a device so that they had a brand new laptop, if they had a hotspot, if they needed that connection, that we needed to try to bridge some of those gaps. And so some of the ways that we're leveraging our, our available resources, and this goes back pre-pandemic. Uh, if you think about sort of the historical investment that the state of Oregon decided to make with mm -hmm. the Student Success Act, uh, a key element in there was the student investment account. And we went on the road and we heard from our students, we heard from our community, we heard from our educators. And, you know, when, when we assembled all of that feedback, you can find it on our, on our website, you know, what they spoke to was our students need direct services. They need supports. Uh, we need to enhance an ability to also mind things like the social, emotional, mental health needs of our students. So thankfully for us, we had already made a decision to invest in dozens and dozens of social workers in mental health in counselors. Um, and we, we had those in place and then the pandemic hit. Um, and so thank goodness for us, you know, in some ways we were more prepared than we might have been, um, but leveraging the student investment account has afforded us that level of capacity. Now we know government has also made COVID relief monies available. So, you know, the community can rest assured we're, we're being responsible public stewards of that resource and where has it been invested? In PPE equipment, in all the precautionary, me precautionary measures that we have to take to make sure our buildings are prepared and they're prepared. The plexiglass, the signage, the, all of the kinds of accruements that are gonna be necessary that, that are in place as we welcome our students back Back. And, you know, I already mentioned, you know, the investment we made in technology, uh, for instance. Uh, and then I'll say uh, that that's an immediate sort of uh, quick relief. We hope that there'll be a second package coming to us that'll allow us mm -hmm. to enhance the supports we know that our students and, and our educators will need. Uh, so they're successful as they start to come back into our schools. We're going to continue to be tenacious advocates for federal monies uh, because we think, Yes, there's a short-term pandemic need, but we need we need a long-term sustainable investment in pre-K 12. No better investment, good stock, pays dividends, early education, uh, get them up front. Uh, let's narrow those opportunity gaps uh, so our students are kindergarten ready. But let's, let's make a statement about public education in this country. Um, and I think that you're starting to hear some of that advocacy pay off. Uh, let's think of the long-term. What would it look like if we had resources to really invest in the professional learning and capacity building of our educators and leaders? We talk about the importance of workforce development and diversity. Catrice and I know there's very few of us in the state, at least in the superintendency. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we know that our students benefit, all students benefit when they see diverse educators uh, in, in their midst. And so how do we invest in all of those diverse pipelines to make sure those candidates are there? And how are we cultivating and nurturing them? I'm thankful that we're seeking input from our own staff around ways that we might do that. And all of us benefit from learning how to work more effectively with the diverse learners that we serve. And so I hope that the federal government, you know, walks the talk and invests amplified monies in title funds and migrant ed monies and SPED IDEA monies. Uh, all of those are long overdue uh, and frankly have never been funded at the level they should have been. That will enable districts to do the kind of work that I know that our educators would love to do. And I think it's going to get us closer to realizing the vision that our community has defined. So to answer your question, those are some of the ways we're leveraging available resources to deal with the immediate as we think about the long term and accomplishing our vision for student success. Absolutely. And another way to leverage those resources, as you mentioned earlier, Superintendent Guerrero, is through partnerships. So I want to turn to what that looks like for you, Dr. Pereira. Like, how will you partner differently? with external organizations that the whole home and school thing has been sort of blown up recently, right? There's no more division between those two. How will you partner with parents or external organizations to make sure, like uh, Guadalupe said, that the, the gaps aren't amplified as kids sort of come back into our schools? 
Absolutely. And I'll begin with the old adage, it takes a village, right? It takes a village and every villager has a responsibility. And and no matter what your address is or, or your zip code, you have a responsibility whether you have kids in the school district or not. But it also takes education leaders to have somewhat of a vision of, of what's important and in order to be able to uh, have that shared vision and and garner partnerships. If you don't know what you want, how do you know who you, you're looking for to help you with that? So that compelling vision for me uh, is important that enables our leaders in our school districts to somewhat um, anticipate an exciting future. And it also allows them to provide um, somewhat of a rallying cry, if you will, in, within the community to energize big things. Um, our families here in Gresham, especially our uh, culturally specific families, uh, the community-based organizations, we, we have continuously worked our communication. Uh, it is something that was lacking as I, I um, arrived here in Gresham Barlow, and it's something I've continued to work towards. And the pandemic, actually, it was probably the worst, best thing for those type of scenarios, you know what I mean? Because it was amplified uh -huh. and, and, and exposed beyond our, our walls as a school. So I, I say that, and, and I never want to waste a good crisis uh, in order to not improve on some things. Um, and so again, we continuously work on improving our communication all year long. We are very intentional uh, and deliberate about addressing the known issues. And so we look for partners to help us with that. Uh, via um, monthly forums or town halls, we're able to listen to our families, to listen to our students, so that they can share their perspective um, to be streamlined necessarily in a way to serve students remotely, right? Uh, with our business industry, we are very proud of the fact that we've had partnerships with the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce um, and the Work Ready Program, both of which have been very generous and very supportive of the Gresham Barlow School Districts, uh, which is um, creating somewhat of a one-stop hub for our students' uh, work experiences uh, that we are trying to center here in East Multnomah County. You see, we've been able to leverage multiple opportunities for social emotional connection as well uh, through outreach programs, as well as outreaching to families. Um, that portal to that home has been very, very important. And I think that's something that we need to make sure that we, we harness and continue to move that forward uh, in order for connections between our teachers and our families um, that it can better serve our students. Absolutely. And Director Calderon, uh, to continue with that theme, thinking about the partnership between early childhood and K-12, uh, I would love to get your thoughts about how that handoff could be warmer, smoother, so that kids come in uh, to kindergarten ready to learn and what that partnership could look like between a K-12 system and the early childhood system as we move forward. Oh no, did we lose Miriam? Well, while she's coming back, I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the last eight months and what that's been like. Uh, both of you have mentioned uh, briefly about the racial uh, racial injustice and racial uh, movement that have been, that's been happening in our country over the last few, few months. Uh, I, I have to say that I've had more conversations about racial justice since last May than I have had in my entire life, even though I've been black this whole time. Uh, I'm really excited for what that could mean as we go back into uh, regular life or our schools uh, as we move forward. One of the things I, I'd like to continue to remind myself is that it's hard to change things when you don't see what's going on. And now I think more of us are seeing a lot of what's been happening to some of us the whole time. Um, and so the question I want to start with, uh, Superintendent Guerrero, what have you seen recently that you can't unsee? And then how will that change the way you lead Portland Public Schools? Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced, right? James Baldwin. I think we're all familiar That's with right. that quote. One of my favorites. Um, and to your point, Toya, the awareness, the collective awareness, that I think uh, has been raised around issues of racial justice and disparities, you know, I think they are at an all time high uh, this past year. And what an opportunity to sort of walk the talk and, and our improved understandings uh, and for other folks to see maybe what some of us, for some of us has been our lived experience all along. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of what I think I can't unsee uh, that certainly ha has 
underlying sort of uh, some core beliefs um, that are important to keep being mindful of is the importance of listening to our youth and in particular uh, to center our students of color because it's them who have had the courage to interrupt some of the systemic barriers that have been omnipresent. Uh, how do we improve our organizational cultures? How do we challenge pervasive narratives uh, all in service of our educational mission, you know, to improve our school system. Uh, and if we do that, how does it actually lead towards racial equity and social justice? So this pandemic aside, you know, we have as a community said, you know, there's a graduate portrait. There's some traits. We want everybody who walks across that stage. We, we want them to have those characteristics. And our community took a year to really sort of articulate those and elevate you know, skills and dispositions that speak to a sense of belonging, right? And so it was our students who said, you know, I don't know that if I, I don't know that I feel safe with school resource officers in my building. We listened very carefully, mm -hmm. right? That could, that could be a little bit of a con controversial sort of topic, and it is. And what we realize is, you know, they want, when they're on campus, they they want to feel like it's a safe space and that the adults that they come into contact with whether they're an armed police officer or anyone else that they're there with with their uh to nurture them and to cultivate their success how do we align our policies and our practices towards that need for a sense of belonging youth leadership i'll give you another recent example and i know it's du jour during a time of you know racial awakening renaming schools well you know some folks want to just, you know, overnight change change all the names. Well, it's not about that. It's about taking the opportunity to ch to channel the leadership of our of today's youth and and sort of build upon decades of work by Black, Indigenous, and communities of color to sort of disrupt these this cultural and institutionalized racism. It permeates our systems. The, the names are just sort of a, a symptom of that, and so it's really important. And we saw it here with our first high school. You, you heard about our new Ida B. Wells uh, Barnett. That that was a very carefully and curated process uh, by our youth. And kudos to them. Uh, and and I really commend them for you know not just the name change, but the experience and the demonstration that they have now established for other school communities and youth to say, that's something we can do too. Let's have a dialogue about it because it's a teachable moment. The other thing I would say I can't unsee is like, there's a real opportunity here to think about sort of the transdisciplinary education. We had thousands of youth on the bridge crying out about climate justice. You know, and so now co-developed with business and teacher leaders and students, uh, call it disruptive. I think it's not an essential course of study. And here you have us being sort of a national leader in many ways for folks that say climate justice is important, but now we're embedding it into the courses of study. And so it's this sort of these commitments into action, these espoused beliefs actually getting executed on that I think you know, need to be that counter narrative building that needs to be part of not just a national dialogue and an espoused commitment to racial equity and social justice and Black Lives Matters, but as a superintendent, uh, what rich opportunities we have at this moment to disrupt these systems, welcome in our partners in our community and to lean in into these racial equity, social justice commitments. So that, that's what I would say about that. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to our youth. We'll have some questions from them later on. Uh, in a few minutes, actually, uh, turning back to Miriam Calderon, want to, you know, get, pick your brain on what racial justice looks like in the early childhood setting. What does that look like in the in the in the early childhood space? Yeah, thanks for that question, Toya. And I apologize, I uh, lost some connectivity there for a while. So no glad worries. I, um, I, you know, I think one of the um, one of the uh, most significant um, uh, racial justice issues, I think um, there are many <laughs> in our field. We haven't yet built, I think, an equitable early learning system. As I said before, race, income, and zip code are unfortunately predictors of what kinds of child care and early learning experiences families and children are going to have before they start kindergarten. Um, we have not yet built, I think, a system that eliminates that as a predictor and recognizes what we all know from the science that, you know, um, children are born learning, right? And um, we don't wait to five or six years or past the 2000 days um, to be able to support that. Um, 
But, you know, I think what I'll focus on in this moment is, is really the workforce, right? So we have, I think as, as um, Dr. Pereira said, um, early childhood education and our birth to five educators and, and providers are, um, it's also a woman dominated profession. Um, it's um, very diverse. Um, it is disproportionately comprised of uh, low income women, women of color, immigrant women, women who speak languages other than English. That is an asset. But what we see is significant disparities um, in the respect afforded um, to those workers. We see a, per a field with perpetually low wages that doesn't allow for birth to five educators to often meet their own needs or not be low income themselves, meet the needs of their families. And we still see wage and compensation disparities and workforce conditions um, within that field along the lines of race um, and and uh, language and income. So, you know, um, I, I think that if we are really going to uh, deliver um, the kinds of early learning experiences, you know, for me, equity is often, especially in the early learning space, talked about as access, but equity is very much about the, ch the experiences that children and families have in the program. And until we have a workforce that looks like kids and families in our communities, that is supported, that is, you know, that has professional learning, that has fair wages, that has uh, paid sick leave, workforce supports, um, you know, uh, equitable working conditions that is respected along the lines of, of our of our K-12 system teachers. You know, I don't know that um, we're going to have the kind of early learning system that we know that we all need um, for children and families, especially um, um, BIPOC communities. Um, so that is uh, that that is for me something that we absolutely have to tackle. Um, something that I can't unsee from the beginning of this emergency is is you know a tweet from a childcare uh, an infant teacher in our city who said I have 101 fever um, and I'm going to work today because I have to at the very early stages of this pandemic because I have no paid sick leave um, because I can't afford not to. Um, that's what I can't unsee. Um, and we know that those disparities are exacerbated for our providers of color. Um, and when they're not well cared for, they can't take care for our, our babies and our children. Absolutely. Uh, let's switch gears before we go to audience questions and talk about structures. Uh, we, we mentioned that school days, my snow days, sorry, may look differently as we move forward, but wanted to hear what else should be left sort of on the cutting room floor. If we were rebuilding this system again, what would we leave and what would we do without? Let's start with Dr. Pereira. Sure. Um... I just want to add one thing, though, Toya, about the not being able to see yeah. it anymore. As I look at data, I mean, we all depend on data for various different things um, throughout the country, and you can just about find data to support whatever you want to support, right? But I would, I would challenge Oregon, and I would challenge the United States to look at the data from March until now, or whenever we go back in person. Look at the number of of uh, IEPs and discipline that have occurred. Mm -hmm. I have been in multiple districts, literally cross, to, cross country, right, coast to coast. And as I look at my data, these says we have not overly identified BIPOC students for IEPs in these last few months, and we have not overly disciplined students, BIPOC students, in these last few months. However, when they're in our buildings, those things occur. Again, doesn't matter where that building lies and where it is. But again, to answer the, the more appropriate question or the immediate question is, where do we go from here? Uh, in the sense that as we look at our structures, I think we have to look at implementing what we've passed, what we've done and what we've put together and how we've done that well. And to build back better, I think was part of your question earlier, I think we need to ensure that we use the best of our creative problem solving. How did we get here where we did not overly identify these groups of students in these last 10, nine months or whatever it's been? How and why has that not happened? Um, and I think the real test is when we do come back together, like how we've been able to navigate that now and when we come back together in person and how is that going to be? So we have some work to do there. Um, 
I would also say that uh, we have to look at implementing again to build back better and looking for ways, creative problem solving that we've used throughout COVID, that should continue to move forward as we go move in throughout this world, right? It continues, should continue. We also want to look at, for example, in every school, we've added daily advisory lessons. I think that's a, a new part of our structure for 20 to 30 minutes every grade level, right? That advisory lesson focus opportunity has, has really, really put a large emotional support net around our students and our staff. It's allowed them in, to engage in ways they had not. It also uh, has helped build positive relationships and connections. Um, and it is it has become widely seen as a success. Um, and I would also, I would add this last thing in that as we move forward, I would hope our structure includes, um, I won't say the elimination, but the, the, the validity, if you will, of assessments. Uh, that we pray so we put so much pressure on, uh, but look at what happened last spring. We dropped them in a matter of a minute, a moment. Honestly, so that tells me one thing: it's really not that important for us to have those those assessments in place. No one on this listening to this today would accept the fact that someone would come to their office or their job and assess them for 30, 45 minutes a day, once a year, and then that's how they're labeled for the remainder of their career unacceptable folks unacceptable and so we have to start looking at the strength base of that and look at looking at the growth and progression of our students as opposed to what that outcome is right um, because again kids most learning is too multivariate to say that everybody should be here the 10th month of, of the of the school year or the seventh month of the school year i'm sorry you and i are very different right <laughs> So again, what you know, I may or may not know and vice versa. And to say that we must know it at the same time, we're setting ourselves up for failure and given an unfair labels to our students, our teachers and our schools. I'd love That's to right. pick That's up for least... Oh, go for it. We're running short <laughs> sure, on time. Dr. So just brief. Yep, go for it. Sure. Look, we all went to school. We have very traditional, pervasive views. Uh, it's a Prussian model. It's very egg crate. It hasn't changed in hundreds of years. And so uh, this disruption has showed that we can pivot. Uh, and I think when you look at all of those categories in our education sector, in our industry, you know, that there are things that we can look at. You know, we, we, we have to reimagine time and space. Uh, Catrice was just talking about assessments. What does that look like when it's authentic? How do we rethink the early education continuum if we know our students develop in varied ways? And so are we prepared for more multi-age settings? How do we, how do we incorporate mm -hmm. authentic uh, assessments? Yes, we need some snapshots, some formative assessments. I would love to see an eighth grade capstone where a student is reflecting on their own social emotional growth and what skills they're looking forward to learning, that they've explored their identity mm -hmm. and their sense of agency, that they have a pathway in mind as they enter uh, high school. Uh, so those are some of the, the structures I think we, we can look at. And I am so glad that some of those dialogues have begun for us in some of our middle school redesign work. I'm so thankful for uh, Preschool for All. Thank you for your leadership, Commissioner Vega Peterson and everybody that participated, that we're starting to look at sort of that point of entry and, and what, what does that consistent quality of, of service look like? We need to do that all across the board and we're educators. The interconnectedness, that what's, that's what can't end up on the cutting room floor. We need a, an actual children, youth, and families agenda in this region that can really serve our families. We're talking about the same people. How does human services, social services, how does everybody think about the same community and its members? Uh, that, that, that would be an exciting conversation. I'm hoping that we have the opportunity to create that kind of a demonstration and counter narrative in our Center for Black Student Excellence. And I'm looking forward to that work in partnership with our community. Toya, can I have like Five seconds. Can I have five seconds? Uh, yes. Just one more thing yes, I say about that. Uh, I think I think of schools as being in the truth business. We're about the truth, right? And what is right for kids? We cannot be in the truth business if we're not willing to have those conversations about truly what our students need individually. I think we going forward, we we should not just mourn what our students have lost in learning over these last few months and these opportunities, but yet look for ways to empower them, to help them understand the context of this moment that we're in, the history of their community. And we should be able to give them ways to that they can be active agents of improving the society. Our kids have the answers. They do. You are uh, and right. I, I really on them. 
Speaking of answers and questions from students, we have one queued up for you all from uh, Anna Beltaneo from uh, Gordon Russell High School in Gresham Barlow, or sorry, Middle School in Gresham Barlow. Hello, my name is uh, Anna Beltaneo, and I'm a seventh grader who goes to Gordon Russell Middle School. I'm sorry if I seem a bit twitchy during this. I've never really done this before. I want to start off talking about the future education in Oregon. First, the learning. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one in class who feels like this, but it's pretty easy to zone out or get bored. No offense. <laughs> I feel like I would learn so much better if the teaching is more fun and energetic. It would all also help a lot with kids' mental health. Speaking of mental health, that brings me to the next topic. I really hope that instead of always focusing on grades and test scores, I would very much like for schools to focus more on the students and of why they aren't doing so good, like on how kids feel and you should always know that we just want to be kids and not spend, spending hours on being like a working adult. Uh, we are not bad students, we just dislike the stress it gives us, so we decide to run away from it. Speaking of this topic, how can we make this problem go away? Well, make the students feel safe and wanted. Make them want to speak up like how I'm speaking up now. And just so you know, this is taking up so much guts to make this video that I'm shaking and I made a script. <laughs> um, make the students feel like you are proud so they don't feel like a constant let down for turning in things late or not being able to do best because it's hard for them to understand through a screen. With COVID and many other things going on right now, there's not much to balance out the hate. That's why we procrastinate, and it's so we feel more better. Anyways, thanks for listening, and I hope this helps. Bye. So Annabelle said a lot there. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it to you first, uh, Dr. Pereira, since she's one of your students. Would love to just hear a little bit about how you all are supporting the social emotional needs of our students right now. We got a lot of questions from folks. Mainly, most of them were around social emotional supports for students. So I'd love to hear from each of you and then we'll close out today because we're a little bit past one o'clock. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. And, and here's the thing is, I probably should have saved that five second uh, comment I made just before this question was made and that being in the truth business uh, that not necessarily did not want to say it, but in the sense that I think it pairs more with this question. And, this, and it, it forces us now more than ever as I see students like Annabelle coming forward and having her voice heard. For me, um, we now more than ever need to think about how we prepare and implement uh, instructional models for our students um, that can be challenging, but because learning again is multivariate and our work cannot be about predictions, but what truly is needed for our students right now and in this moment, which leads me to believe now, again, now more than ever, we have to think about how we teach and what we teach. You know, it's, it's, it's that simple for me, if you will. You know, I, I have a cold, I walk into CVS, I don't go grab vitamins because I have a cold. Well, maybe I get vitamin C or something like that, but I get some medication that specifically addresses what I need. And we have to be able to do that. And while I think there's no right way uh, to incorporate um, those type of things within a school, what I do know works best is that if, when it's done with, with fidelity. There's so many initiative things coming forward. If it's not done with fidelity, uh, then you see situations where students feel like they're not, they don't belong, that, that they don't want, they don't want them to be a part of anything, that they don't feel like they have anything to contribute. Um, and I think we've been talking about this all along, the whole representation piece. You know, representation matters for every student, um, no matter what. And I'll use just one little example before I close out is that 
whenever I go into my ki- my kindergarten classes, because I love being out in the schools and reading to our students, I cannot tell you there isn't a time that I've gone and done that where our students of color haven't come to the front of that that the squares are every time. And I had not noticed it took my communications director to point that out. So we've got to do a better uh, a better uh, uh, way of doing of delivering instruction that is for students and, and what they need, um, but also making sure that we reflect on it because our kids, uh, they need, they, we need to ensure that there's some empathy going on too as well. Um, and so I see obstacles, but I also see opportunities going forward in this. And of course, it's coming out of the mouths of babes. Well said. Director Calderon, anything to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Toya. I guess when I hear Annabelle talk, I, I think about what she said about, um, you know, so much about her um, her confidence, her love of learning, um, the joy of learning, um, and, um, you know, the attributes of being a learner. And when, and I think about naturally that those, those knowledge, skills, competencies, dispositions are set in the foundation is set in the early childhood years, right? So we have, um, the opportunity during these years and these formative years to to really focus on you know how children um, make connections with others you know how they develop positive identities how they learn to be in a group in a community um how they know and understand difference and characteristics right from themselves their own families their communities and others um so their approaches to learning their social emotional development um the development of their memories and how they learn to learn is all happening at this time and um, we, you know, we have that is the moment and opportunity, and if we create more of that focus and opportunity for more students like Annabelle to have that experience. I think that carries them in through their through their um, school careers and their lives. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I hope we change, we learn from this and we break down some of the silos between early care and education and the K-12 system, and we start to recognize that The early childhood system is about care, holistic development and support of the family and learning and development. And so is the K-12 system. I think in some ways, childcare gets marginalized as a work support for families Mm -hmm. and the K-12 system is focused on education and we don't talk enough about the care part. So I hope through this pandemic, we can create those kinds of break down those silos and really begin to think about, not push down and focus on letters, numbers, and colors to the early childhood years, but actually, you know, think about partnership with families, children's holistic development as being a continuum birth through the K-12 system and both systems really, as I think Guadalupe said, need to be child and family centered. So um, I think there was a lot of what um, Annabelle said that if we could do a better job earlier, right, um, those would be um, more opportunities for more students like her that would be um, a positive shift into the future. Superintendent Guerrero, I'll let you have the last word. Well, Annabelle, I'm assuming you're listening to our responses. I don't see you on screen, but uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, good for you. Thank you for using your voice, Uh, because what I heard you name was numerous areas where you feel we can do better. And what I also heard is they're not just topics of interest to you. You spoke on behalf of your classmates and your peers as well. You said, I noticed that this is having an impact on the mental health of my classmates. And so I think in all of the work that we do, you know, aimed at continuous improvement, we have to keep creating those spaces to hear from, from our youth. And we have to help them find their own sense of agency and develop that voice as well. So I'll just give one, one quick example. We're thinking about what can we do to create a middle grades experience that really actually gets at those characteristics? So part of part of our initial process is to go on this empathy tour and hear from middle grade students like Annabelle say, what's important to them during this often awkward time that they want out of the experience? And what does success look like at the end of eighth grade such that they could reflect on their own growth? So thank you, Annabelle, for reminding us if we keep students' voices at the center, that many of the answers, they're right there. Thank you. And thank you all for reminding us to keep our our kiddos and their families at the center of all the work that we do. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you all who tuned in to to listen to our conversation. Hopefully you got some of your questions answered. 
I uh, really appreciate you all being with us today, and I hope that you all get to go outside and enjoy the snow. So thank you guys so much. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Joya. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.